Happy Wednesday and welcome to a new episode of the Influence Factor by the Influencer Marketing Factory. Today with me, we have Michael Kay, that is the Global Director of Brand Marketing and Communication at OKCubit. If you like this episode, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Enjoy the show. Hey, Michael, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. I love to have you new. Today, uh, this is, you know, the first time that we have someone that works for a dating app. So I'm quite excited to, you know, learn about what do you do uh, and also learning more about, you know, the industry. It's changed so much because of social media. We're going to go more in detail later on, you know. But for everyone that is listening today, uh, you know, who is Michael? Uh, tell us a bit more about your background and what are you doing, you know, nowadays at the OKQ. Yes. Yeah, so I handle... Uh, brand marketing and communications at OKCupid. So under my umbrella is going to be communications and public relations, influencer marketing, social media. So I really say that storytelling is that common thread across everything that I'm doing here at OKCupid. And before I joined here, I spent about five years on the agency side working at boutique midsize and large firms on clients across the board from CPG brands to QSR brands to personal care and grooming. I'm also a adjunct instructor at New York University, and I am also on the board of the Human Rights Campaign focused on the greater New York area. So basically, I don't enjoy sleeping. <laughs> you keep yourself busy. I can see that. Uh, is, is this storytelling stuff that you always loved is it something that you know was always a passion of yours or is it something that you like it was it natural for you do you think or is it something that you you can study yeah so i actually started to get into storytelling i would say in high school actually i was on my high school newspaper i also did journalism internships in college i was an editor on one of my college newspapers as well so storytelling has always been really interesting to me I realized early on, though, in college that journalism wasn't ever going to be something I pursued full time. Personally, I didn't feel like I was a strong enough writer. So I wanted to find a field that was semi adjacent to journalism. And I did a lot of interning while I was in undergraduate. I did marketing internships, journalism internships, communication internships, public affairs, you name it. And that's sort of how I built the foundation of my career. So pretty much fell in love with storytelling early on. And ironically, my parents told me in the beginning of high school that I was going to go into marketing. And as any teenager would, I completely disagreed with them. Like, was it like, you know, rebel phase? Like, no, nah, marketing is not for me type of thing? Or is it something else? I was just like, you know, my parents said I'm going to do this. So I'm going to do the exact of opposite. <laughs> and then I tried to find any other job that I could think of. So when I first went to college, I remember saying, I think I'm going to be a teacher. Okay. So like, yeah, definitely not, not marketing, right? I'm yes. Not. And now I can't imagine doing anything else. Yeah. I guess that was, you know, as any, anyone, you know, rebel phase again, you know, parents, again, as you just said, if they tell you to do something, you're going to be like, no, no way. I'm going to do just the opposite just because it's you, right? Then you grow up, you realize that oh, maybe. Maybe, maybe, you know, I should listen or at least, you know, I'm going to go whatever li I like, you know, and not doing just because I want to go against them. Um, nice. Fantastic. And um, before, you know, we go more in detail, um, you know, OKCubit is, is well known, right? But for anyone else there, maybe that is not that familiar with, you know, dating apps, uh, um, tell us a bit more, what is it and how does it differentiate? Because there are so many dating apps nowadays. Uh, so tell us, tell us some more about that. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Keep it is one of the OG dating apps. So we've been around for almost 20 years wow. and our core product differentiator is our in-app matching question. So for anyone who hasn't been on our app, when you download OKCupid, when you create an account, you have to start answering our matching questions. And these are what power our algorithm and it's how we connect people. So we're connecting people based on how compatible we think they are, based on how you're responding to our questions, what you say you're interested in, and what the other person says they're interested in. So if I'm on OkCupid and I'm looking at another profile, you'll actually see a match percentage next to their name. And if you click that match percentage, you will see all the questions that you both answered in common, 
and you'll see where you agree and where you disagree. And this is really fun for us. I mean, these questions have been answered more than 115 million times in 2023 alone, over 400 million times last year, and almost 10 billion times since we launched. And we also have localized questions in more than 30 countries around the world, because we understand that what's top of mind to a dater here in New York City or Los Angeles is very different than what's top of mind to someone in London or Tel Aviv or Mumbai or Tokyo. That's that's crazy just to think about like you know the 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 numbers that you just told me. And we're gonna go more in details about data because when we met you told me that you love data. Look at numbers, so we're gonna go more in the in depth there. But uh question for you. So are you using any any AI now nowadays also to to look at questions uh, some somehow or or is it mostly just uh, user based? Like are you helping users to understand like how to, for example, answer questions, how to ask questions, like do you use that anything there just to facilitate that that type of thing yeah so most dating apps are actually already using ai and have been for quite some time when it comes to moderation and safety and security on the app what we're doing additionally that's a little bit different is we started testing chat gbt and what we did was you know we noticed that there was an appetite here this is a trending topic on okcupid there was a 91% increase in mentions of artificial intelligence and chat GBT on OkCupid profiles at the beginning of this year compared to the month prior. So we thought, how do we integrate this new technology into our platform in a way that feels really authentic and organic for OkCupid? So for us, that went right back to our matching question. So we actually asked chat GBT, what would you ask on a dating app? or what would you ask on a date with someone? And we started adding in some of those questions that they proposed or it proposed. And these questions were about everything from what you value most in a partner to how you can balance your own needs with the needs of a partner in a relationship. And they've been live in the app for about two months at this point, and they've already been answered a, around 675,000 times. So because this has been really popular for us, a really successful experiment, we've actually committed to adding in new chat GBT generated questions every single month throughout the rest of 2023. And we're going to get, you know, more specific with these prompts that we're giving chat GBT. So the question that we're going to ask the platform is going to go well beyond what would you ask on a dating app? And we're going to get more specific on topics that are really important to our daters, like trust in a relationship, for example. Fantastic. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, because I've been reading a lot and talking a lot about AI and like, you know, this might be one of those good case uses, like, you know, uh, sorry, use cases, like, you know, it's it's a way where you, uh, you know, generate new questions based on a lot of data that is out there, right? Um, and, and I can see like, you know, the, it, it's, it's a bit funny that like, you know, maybe like, you know, we have to ask AI sometimes for something that is like dating that is like interpersonal, right. But I'm pretty sure that you have so much data, right. To look at and taking from that. Sometimes you look more at statistics that just maybe on the feeling, right. Because if you're on a dating app, you're already filtering out people, right. Depending on criteria, right. So having also AI that can help you in that, uh, potentially it's, it's going to be a more powerful type of tool. Is there anything that, uh, you might think that uh, is it still missing? Like in the, in could be either the questions like or something that you noticed that, that uh, or maybe something that uh, people are, are loving it. Like you know, uh, and and then you think that on your app uh, you should even like maybe double down on that again. Could, is it about the question? Is it about the type of profile? Is it about uh, um, the, the way how people use it? Because again, each app is different. Uh, uh, in type of communication, is is there something that you love particularly of of, of okay Cupid that you think it's uh, again what makes this such a difference uh, apart from the the questions? Is there any anything else on that? Yeah, so I I think what I personally love about okay Cupid is that we by design by product design bring in a higher intent dater. Mm -hmm. There are so many dating apps out there, a lot of really incredible ones. I met my partner on a dating app. And I think where OkCupid really stands out is for those people who are looking for a long-term 
more meaningful relationship. And the way we do that is you don't just upload your name and a photo and your location and start seeing millions of people. On a Cupid, you have to fill in multiple profile prompts. You have to add in multiple photos. You have to answer at least 15 of our matching questions, although most people go on to answer dozens and dozens more. So we actually make you do a lot of work at the beginning to create a profile. And the people who are not taking dating seriously and they just want a quick hookup, they wind up during this onboarding phase say, screw it, I, I, I need to download something else. And that's okay with us. Um, and, you know, um, you know, we, we, we do do that on purpose because we want to make sure that when you see another user on OkCupid, you know that this is someone who is willing to put in the effort and time and work that it takes to go on dates and have a strong relationship and a lasting relationship. Hey, quick break. This podcast is hosted by the Influencer Marketing Factory. We are an influencer marketing agency that helps brands and companies engage with Gen Z and millennials on social media. We take care of influencer identification, storytelling, creativity, negotiation, contracting, campaign management, error analysis, in-depth reporting, code and boosting, and much, much more. Are you interested in learning more? You can find us at theinfluencermarketingfactory.com or you can Google The Influencer Marketing Factory. This reminds me as an analogy in the B2B, like uh, whenever you do lead generation, if you ask more questions, you're going to have like, you know, less leads, uh, but quality ones. Compared to asking only for name and email address, you're going to have like receive many of them, but they're not qualified, right? I'm looking at this on a business and marketing perspective. I'm pretty sure it is also the same for you, right? The more questions, the more it, you, it can go in depth. You're going to have less people at the end of the funnel, but the good ones, and I'm most probably sure that at the end of the day, your app is bringing in more matches, right? Because of all the data. And so talking about that, again, you told me, you know, when we met quickly that uh, you love looking at numbers. What are some of the numbers and insights uh, um, that uh, either it had you the most to talk about when it comes to dating and also dating together with social media? Because as you said, OkCupid had been there for 20 years, uh, even before that social media was a thing. So social media changed dating, right? Uh, it created trends, it created way to say, and you know, uh, and it's so much more, right? Uh, so, so many references in the pop cultures as well. But we're going to go more in detail uh, on that. Any numbers that you want to share with us that you think are either like you know, eye-opening or something that people don't really realize, again, about dating on one end and also dating together with social media, if you have anything on that. Yeah, so data is how we learn about trends in dating and relationships, and the numbers tell stories mm -hmm. about shifts in culture and society. And what's nice about being around for almost 20 years is that we can identify these shifts as they're happening and sometimes before they're happening. So for example, when I say the numbers tell a story, a couple of trends that we're seeing on OkCupid by the numbers, one is that discussions around mental health are really attractive to people in 2023, something that's very different than in years past. So we know this because we can see that more than nine in 10 daters on OkCupid say they are sensitive. And we're seeing that this honesty is really paying off when it comes to dating, especially for men. Last year, men who said they were sensitive on OkCupid received 107% more likes and 86% more matches. And they had 113% more conversations than men who said, you know what, I'm just not that sensitive. Um, and another trend that we're seeing is that young daters are causing increases in sober dating. So again, we're able to identify this because of how long we've been around. So in 2012, about 10 years ago, 84% of singles on OkCupid said they were open to dating someone who doesn't drink alcohol, but that jumped to 96% of respondents in 2022. And we noticed that young daters are leading the charge here. Gen Z singles on OkCupid were the most likely this last year to opt for a relationship with someone who is sober compared to millennials and compared to Gen Xers. So those are just two quick examples of how we're identifying different trends and shifts in behaviors amongst our users by looking at the numbers. And in terms of this 
crossover with social similarly to Twitter or TikTok or Instagram, we're always paying attention to what's happening on social. We're paying attention to these trending conversations. Our questions are not stale. The questions that you see today are not the questions that were added to the app when you know we launched in 2004. Some of the more general, generic dating and relationship questions are, but we're adding in new questions every single week. So we have to really pay attention to what's happening in culture and the economy and society and politics because those trending topics on social are inspiring our new questions so that when I go on to OkCupid now, I can see questions about climate change and marriage equality and reproductive health care, the Black Lives Matter movement. If there's a conversation that's trending on social, if there's a conversation you're having with your friends, your family, your coworkers, we want to make sure that we're asking about that on OkCupid because that's clearly top of mind for our target audience. Very interesting. Do you have also any example of uh, something that was happening, for example, in a specific moment? How did you use it, right, to include it and implement it quickly in your app uh, so that you were showing to people, right, uh, that uh, you know what is happening and uh, Okay, Qubit can understand that, you know, what is trending, uh, what is happening in society. Do, do you have any example for us? Yeah, absolutely. I would say the biggest example is um, something that happened a couple of years ago. And um, we were analyzing responses from OKCubit's okay in-app questions. And we were thinking, what story can we tell that's really ownable to OKCubit okay that none of our competitors would, would be able to insert themselves into the conversation on. And, you know, we noticed that our questions about climate change and the environment had been answered about 15 million times already, which is a huge sample size. And 97% of our respondents said they believe climate change is real. And 81% said they were really concerned about climate change. So we actually posted a tweet on Twitter, and it said something along the lines of, only on our app can you filter out climate change deniers. And the tweet went viral. We supported it with PR. It became a huge story for us here in the United States. And then we took that story across markets. It, we went first to the United Kingdom. We leveraged environmental activist Greta Thunberg's popularity to create OKCubit's okay first ever dating trend, which we called Thunberging. And Thunberging referred to two people matching online over a shared belief in climate change and the environment. And that helped us really create a global story. Um, we reached a new demographic, which was Gen Z for us by leaning into a key issue that was top of mind uh, for their generation. We also started to get uh, make headlines in top tier publications within countries we weren't even actively marketing in, like Cosmopolitan France, who did a whole feature story on this. And to date, there's been over 500 stories around the world that reference OKCupid and climate change or Thunberging, and all of that uh, encompasses our ownable data, which is obviously a huge win for us. That's also spurred into product features. We've released a climate change advocate badge with more, which more than half a million daters have already added to their profile. We've launched partnerships with two different environmentally focused nonprofit organizations. So, you know, this all started from a topic that we saw being talked about a lot on social, a lot on the press. We put out a tweet, pitched this story out, and I mean, to be honest, in the beginning, we only had three data points that we were leaning on. Those couple points that I mentioned at the beginning of, you know, this part of the conversation. So it wasn't like we were investing a lot of time or money. We were being creative and scrappy. And, you know, we've kind of dominated this conversation for three years now. Love it. Very smart. How, how does it work like the process? Do you work with a data team and you look at what is happening, for example, training like uh, like, do you have like a sort of dashboard of what is happening? And then you are the one identifying the potential opportunities 
or is it like a data team that comes to you with opportunities and then you choose it? Do you talk with other people in your team? I don't know if you can go through a bit more about that, but it would be really interesting from like looking at the data, clean up the data, and then find a potential strategy. How, how does it work usually? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So I'm actually using the platform myself. So when I first joined OkCupid, um, and still to this day, actually, I was the only person globally for the brand in a communications role. And here in the United States, our biggest market, I don't even have agency support. So during my first few weeks, I thought, okay, how am I going to be as nimble as possible? How am I going to work quicker than all our competitors who have much bigger, more robust communications teams? And I went to our data science team and I said, I need you to train me as if I'm a data analyst. I need to be able to understand and leverage the tools that you use so that I can cut out the middleman. So when a reporter comes to me, I don't have to jump through all these hoops to get a data point. So every day or multiple times a week, I'm looking at our platform. I'm looking for major shifts in how people are answering questions. I'm breaking down responses by different demographics because I'm able to see I, you know, overall responses, but then I can break it down by city, by state, by country, by gender, by generation. So I'm looking at all these different factors to see where is there a story within these numbers. And because I'm doing it myself, because I'm so close to the data, it's a lot easier for me to work quickly and efficiently. No, yeah, congrats on that. I mean, like proactive and being like, I want to be the one in reading the data. I, I can understand like the power of that, right? Because if you go to a data team, maybe you can ask for data, but there might be a little bit of a gap, right? Between what you have in mind, right? And also what you can get from others. So working directly by yourself, that definitely should help a lot. And uh, so you said this like helped you to, you know, break into like, you know, break through all these noise, right? Of all these other dating apps, you got a lot of PR for free, a lot of earned media. Is there anything else that you've done that worked well, again, to uh, maybe either like, you know, something out of the box, uh, something that, uh, that that help you, you know, out to, again, beat the competition with the, um, uh, a different approach? Yeah. So the data is obviously a huge piece of that. Mm -hmm. We're a very driven app. And for those who don't know, um, it really shouldn't come as a surprise because we were actually founded by four math majors at Harvard. So our algorithm is very complex. That's why we are very data driven. It's just core to who OKCupid is. I think beyond the data piece, what's worked really well for us, especially in recent years, is paying close attention to who our target consumer is and not trying to be everything for every single person out there. You know, there's a lot of dating apps and chances are there's something for someone. And I do think in the, in the past, we, we, we try to be too much. And recently we really try to hone in on, okay, who are these actual mini communities of people and daters and types of relationships that are on OkCupid? Who are the people who are loyal to us, who are coming back, um, and they're maybe not coming back because they're obviously finding relationships, but the type of daters that are coming in and the types of relationships that they're looking for, really paying attention to those trends and leaning hard into that. So embracing these sub communities, I call them on OKCube. And I think, I think that's worked really, really well for us when it comes to social content we're putting out there, influencers we're parting, uh, partnering with, campaigns that we're creating that's that's sort of been a success for us yeah the importance of like sub communities we talked also about that you know in other episodes uh you know with experts that are working with communities and everyone told me that it's incredible uh how many sub communities of people that have specific niche interests that you didn't even know about they exist and secondly they told me how great it is that people can find themselves accepted in certain communities because some certain people, maybe they think they are alone, right? They feel lonely that they have all those type of interests and hobby or certain type of like, you know, um, things that they believe in, for example, right? And then instead, when they find the other people, uh, that's, that's why it's a great match, right? Even more important than the generic 
right type of uh, hobbies or interests or things that you believe in type of things so i can i can understand why that is that is quite important right if you want to try to talk to everyone you talk to no one right that that works in any type of marketing and business right uh, and uh, also something I was interested to ask you before we go into more on the influencer marketing side that I'm definitely interested in. Um, when we quickly chat, you also told me that during the pandemic there was a redesign of the app, right? Uh, so first of all, how the pandemic affected something like dating, and how did you attack like that moment? How did you how did you like you know, get back? How did you help people uh, during that phase of their life? Yeah. So at the beginning of the pandemic, at least the first week or so, we we were nervous. We we had never experienced a global pandemic before, and we were really interested in how this is going to impact our users, their behavior, their activity. But OKCupid user engagement increased, especially as shutdowns intensified. So all over the world, matches on OKCupid increased 10% and conversations increased over 20 percent and i want everyone to keep into perspective these percentages sound small but there's millions of millions of daters on okcupid in more than a hundred countries globally so it's a lot of activity and engagement that's happening on the app and luckily we had already been in the process of redesigning our app um which was going to be the re biggest redesign in our history. So it came at almost a perfect time because as people were turning to OkCupid more and more and more, we were actually modernizing the app and making dating, you know, a little bit easier. So that summer we rolled out our biggest mobile app redesign and there was a new matching system that we called Stacks internally. And that stacks redesign consolidates multiple discovery methods into one so the new experience shows people in a focused thoughtful way and it gives our users choice and control over who they're dating through a series of new categories so if you're on okcupid you'll notice like circles at the top and it looks almost like instagram stories so um, it's familiar for, you know, people who are on the app and you can click into these different categories, which are Cupid's picks, which are people we think you're most compatible with match percentage, very similar, um, pro choice. So this stack has people who have said that they are pro choice on OkCupid. We have a passport stack, which shows you people outside of your country who are also interested in dating people outside of their country new people online popular and nearby all which are very self-explanatory categories and we know through data that the redesign worked when we began testing stacks women on okcupid started sending two times as many likes as they were previously so it helped accelerate usage on our app beyond simply just making the app look in my opinion a lot better than when i joined the company Absolutely. So do you think it's because uh, you gave more options or because it was a way to facilitate like filtering up uh, people or was it because, uh, you know, user wanted to experiment new things, for example, or, or is it a combination of everything in that case? I think it's a little bit of both. I, I, as a, um, putting myself in the user's shoes, I think what's nice about Stacks is that it makes me feel like I'm looking at different groups of people because I'm filtering between different categories mm -hmm. of stack. So switching it up is kind of attractive. But then also if I want to find someone who's pro-choice, it's really nice that I can go in and find that category of people. We've had different types of categories like that. So for example, we've had categories that are only climate change believers. Um, we've had ahead of the presidential election here in the United States, we had a category that was called voter. So it was all people who were registered to vote. Um, if that was something that was really important to you, which we know from our data, that that's top of mind for our daters. Um, so that those type of categories like switch out and are, are, are timely. Um, but if I'm looking for new people, people I haven't seen on the apps before, I like that I can jump into that stack and find those people or 
if I'm looking for a date in the next few hours or if I want to meet up with someone quickly, it's nice that I can pop into the online one and find, match and talk to other people who are currently using the app at the same time as me. Interesting. Yeah, I can see how why it is important, right, to always change it and redesign. Because at the end of the day, your users, even more especially on the dating app, are the one that knows what they want to see, what they need, right? So I can understand that having, you know, um, outdated questions, outdated ways how you present like things uh, might not work, right? Because at the end of the day, it's just like a mere representation of real people in the real world that want to use an app to facilitate, right? So I can understand the, the importance of that. And, uh, you know, talking about people, now we get to the, the, you know, section of the, of the podcast that I, you know, personally care the most, you know, like, you know, we are an influencer marketing agency. So we know the importance of influencers and content creators and so on. Um, let's start just like, how, how do you use influencer usually? Then we're going to go more into case studies and do's and don'ts. But when you have to start, like, you know, each company has a different approach. In your case, it's a dating app. It's a people business. It's a, a way to connect people. So when it comes to influencers, it's, you know, it's sort of like, you know, a great, great match, right? For that. How, how do you guys use it? Okay. Qubit when it comes to influencer marketing. Yeah. I, for us, um, because we've been around for so long, it's, I mean, there's still a piece of it. That's all about brand awareness mm -hmm. and, and reaching new people. Um, but a lot of our spend when we're spending in the marketing space is to drive downloads. So it's that education piece um, and, and, you know, leveraging these people with really strong platforms and engaged audiences on who OkCupid is, why we exist, and encouraging them to download the app and experience it for themselves. And, and what are some of the either case studies or campaigns that work well for you? Anything that, you know, for example, you said before about that, you know, like, you know, just adding a new sort of badge that, you know, make us such a, like, you know, PR, uh, you know, interest out of it. Like, is there anything that worked very well using influencers in the past years? Yeah, well, this is, this is a really important space for us. So influencers have become one of our most important marketing levers over the past year or two. And we're investing even more money into influencer marketing this year in, in 2023. So big, like obviously core to, to what we're doing in the marketing space. And when it comes to what works, there's a few things that we're looking at, a few things that we're considering. So, um, in terms of KPIs, for example, where we're looking at overall engagement rate performance compared to individual typical sponsored post, um, engagement rate. We're also watching overall view through rates and seeing if they were ahead of the platform benchmarks and then there's the actual content themes that we're paying attention to. So we've worked on multiple influencer marketing campaigns over the past couple of years. And what we're seeing is that at least for us, all our top performing content utilizes comedic creative executions. It's, it's playful, it's relatable and making people laugh is what really resonates best with our target and our audience. Um, in our last influencer campaign, one of the people we worked with, um, Dylan Mulvaney, she created the top performing content by video views. Her, her view had almost 2 million views for us, but it's interesting when we think about what works for influencers compared to other things within the communications marketing umbrella, because I mentioned that this playful, cheeky content is what performs really well for us. And I find that funny because when it comes to press, um, it's very different. Um, what we see works best for OKCupid is leaning into core, deeper issues like politics. But that content doesn't really resonate as best when we're working with influencer marketing. So I think it's important for all brands to be testing. And you obviously want to maintain a uh, unified brand voice but you do have to be paying attention to the platforms that you're using and what users of those platforms are really looking for from a brand or from an influencer. And I make sense, right? Like in the do's and don'ts, especially depending on the medium that they use, um, you know, you want to be 
authentic. You want to do like, you know, using like storytelling, as we said at the beginning, right? And sometimes you don't want to push too much, much like, you know, uh, like selling, like overselling, right? Especially Gen Z don't want to be sold online. They want to, you want to create a narrative around some of them and be funny, informative, silly, whatever it is. But then, you know, the product is like something that is in there is embedded somehow in a smart way, right? Is there anything else that you found uh, in the, your do's and don'ts? Is there anything that either your um, users on social media through influencers loved or something that you think when you have a dating app you shouldn't ever do? Like, you know, in your own opinion working in these for, you know, many years now. Yeah, well, I actually think you just hit the nail on the head there. Um, people don't want that infomercial mm -hmm. type of content. It's not performing well, but you have to be creative and find a way to insert your brand and insert how you're different from all the competitors in your space in a authentic way. So for us, how that's worked from an influencer perspective is, you know, when it comes to I like to compare influencers with other things and how it changes. So like for press, we will lean into our questions. We talk about our questions. We talk about the data that doesn't really work with influencer content, but our workaround is, um, one example is we worked with an influencer and they created man on the street, creative content. So basically doing these really popular things, videos, types of videos that we've seen on TikTok, where someone, the host is walking around on the street and they're asking different questions. And we had this person um, make sure that all the questions that they were asking related to the questions that were here on OKCupid. And we were able to wrap ourselves into that, you know, conversation and give a quick soundbite at the end, plugging OKCupid, but it didn't feel like an overly branded moment. But when you really look at the content, it's everything related to okay keep its voice our questions and and that's you know that was a really big win for us and it was actually one of the top performing content for that specific campaign yeah can you imagine because you know what we sell the time you want to make videos that people want to share right because they like it for the entertainment of it or the information that is behind that then of course you like if you're able to you know make like you know a cta right call to action at the end it helps right but again if it's all about the CTA, no one will share it. It's still only paying for the video, but no, you're not getting any earned media, right? You're not getting getting any, uh, you know, of your message out there. So it makes sense. And also, I do believe that for a dating app, you can really shape it as you like, right? You can do so many trends, right? You can jump on. You can do so many videos. At the end of the day, again, it's people, right? You can talk about people in any different angles and point of view. So I'm pretty sure there are like so many others, like you know, type of video, right? Uh, and uh, and trends that we can jump on again. It's it's easier, I would say, for this type of app than compared to maybe a B two B software as a service uh, uh, type of business that is might be a bit more difficult to do. Um, to start wrapping on on that, um, is there anything else that I didn't ask you today that you think might be really important for the audience to know, either about your job or what is happening in the dating scene nowadays, uh, uh, online, social media, something that uh, excites you lately? I would, I would just add to not be afraid of the numbers i was really not an analytics person before okcupid i had never really worked with data before for the first five or six years of my career and i was someone who always hated math i was really intimidated by numbers um and here as i mentioned we you know we take such a data-driven approach to communications and marketing at OkCupid, but we're, we're doing that internally and externally as well. So, um, I would say, don't be afraid of the numbers, actually lean into the numbers. And if you're not comfortable, get comfortable. Um, that is something I wish I knew earlier on, but something I learned very quickly here. Absolutely. You know, I, I met also many people that when you're like in front of a Google file, like Excel file or Google sheet. Hey, their eyes completely like, you know, start crossing and, uh, but, uh, taking decision on numbers, right. And not just, you know, like uh, based on your feelings, it makes a huge difference. And also I would add on that, uh, anytime that you have goals uh, saying, I want to do more, that is in everything, right. In life, you know, I mean, if you go to the gym in everything, right. If you want to just say, I want more, 
what does that mean? But if instead you have numbers, right, in goals, that makes a huge difference because then you can go back and be like, did I hit my target? Did I do more? If I did more, why? And you can look at that, right? And be like, oh, we did more because of that. If didn't hit the target, why is that the reason? You still look at the data, right? But if you have no comparison, no benchmarks, how, how can you even calculate that, right? So I like the idea that everyone should look into that, even if you are kind of scared, right, by, by the numbers. So fantastic. Anything else before, uh, before we uh, finish the episode that you want to add? No, I think that's it. Fantastic. Michael, thank you so much for joining me today. I learned so much about, you know, all the dating apps and all the, all the numbers that are behind that. Again, people think, you know, maybe you only just, you know, do all the matching and you think that it's based on nothing. It's based on millions, uh, billions, right, of uh, answered, like, you know, questions, uh, AI, chat GPT all together, plus uh, human beings behind that, that look at what is happening in the real world outside, right? Uh, and trying to understand how to hop on trends, how to understand the needs of people. So thank you so much for that, for sharing it. Definitely a, uh, you know, fascinating world. Thank you so much for having me. This is a great conversation. Amazing. Thank you. This was the Influence Factor by the Influencer Marketing Factory. I'll see you next week.